works. Well, it's saying it's uh, in progress. Okay. Okay. Let's let's get going. I guess we we have uh, three minutes past. So, um, this meeting is really to discuss a POP. So and. Uh, um, so what I would like to do is uh, kind of um, first uh, I have one one page kind of to to uh, to show about the the documents the documents because um, um, Roman and I don't, don't have a very long history with uh, uh, with OAuth and and some of those documents are uh, really old so. Uh, so I want to just present those documents. Uh, th these are mainly the documents that. Uh, Han is shared uh, in the invitation, um, and let me. Oh, where do I share? Do I share here? Share. Okay. Can you guys see my screen? Yeah, hoping. Thank you. Could. Yes, works. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so so uh, I just want to talk about those uh, for for a minute or two here, um, and then um, uh, uh, Brian um, prepared a few slides that he wants also to present and and discuss, and um, I guess we'll we'll take it from there. So um, so that's that's my plan, like uh, just to um, talk about this in general and dig deeper into it. So uh, these are the the. Uh, the documents that uh, uh, we have today about uh, POP um, that are, uh, and I've kind of uh, separated them into a few groups, uh, um, the MAC and POP security architecture, with, which includes the MAC address, the, the, MAC, uh, the MAC draft and, and the POP architecture and, and distribution uh, draft. Um, and then we've talked about the HTTP signatures um, that are, uh, Few old drafts and a new newer one that is being discussed right now. There is the ACE work uh, with one RFC and and uh, a OAuth authorization draft. Uh, there is obviously the POP uh, JOT uh, uh, the, uh, the, that has been on RFC for some time. There is the MTLS work and the recent one is is DPOP. Um, so I guess. Our goal here in this meeting is to to try and to understand the overlaps between all of, all of those um, kind of uh, uh, proposals uh, that we have on the table, um, and and if there are any misalignments between be, be, between those uh, um, proposals, to understand why, and um, and how we we could resolve those. Uh, again, we. we Personally, and and Roman and my, myself, we don't have lots of history with OAuth, um, so uh, some of those are completely new to us. We haven't looked at them um, a long time. For for example, those, those initial ones, uh, the Cavage and and uh, and the signed HTTP request too. So so, um, so that's the goal of the meeting. Um, and any any comments about this? Does that does that sounds like a plan here? Okay. Okay. So um, I don't have slides prepared, so I will, um, I guess, um, um, pass it to uh, Brian to be able to um, kind of walk us through his slides, what he has to say, and uh, and we'll take it from there. Okay. Should I just <clears throat> try to share directly from here? And yes. cover? okay. I cover some of these drafts a little bit too, so I'll try to talk about them a bit more. Let's see. Um, is this? Yeah, we can see it. Does it show up in kind of slideshow mode here? Uh, yeah. Okay. Oops. Um, so yeah. So as is my trademark here, throw a few photos up here, and we've got a. Um, interim meeting, uh, this is the second one between the Singapore and Vancouver, but um, uh, between, yeah, Singapore and Vancouver. So here you are, we're uh, 
want to talk about just sort of the general concepts of proof of possession in OAuth 2 and um, the variety of different tracks of work that are out there and, and what's currently being worked on or that there's interest in and see if we can come to some um, at least uh, agreement on where we should be taking the work and, and what we should be doing going forward. So I'll try to set the stage for some of that and uh, yeah. So uh, back in uh, Singapore at 106, um, we had two different meetings and just to try to set some tone for how we got to this interim, um, there's a recording from the uh, YouTube shows uh, of me in two different outfits at two different meetings presenting the same slide. So I prepared a, a presentation on uh, Depop and uh, tried to <laughs> tried to get through the content twice and was um, Got, got to slide six uh, before a barrage of questions and comments and criticisms were levied and we never made it past there. Um, and during that time, uh, I think during the, the end of the second attempt, Hanna suggested we, uh, we consider doing a virtual interim to see if we could move the conversation forward a little bit more than we had during that time. So some things that were, were not presented at that time were, um, I got through part of the technical explanation of how Depop sort of worked. Hopefully folks on the call are at least familiar with the basics of, of what the proposal is. Um, and then I uh, had a slide here with some, uh, some folks sort of praising or expressing interest in the work to try to show uh, that there was interest out there in, in the work progressing and people uh, eager to see it progress and, and consider implementing it. And that whole uh, presentation was meant to wrap up with a beautiful picture of Vancouver and a humble recall call that the working group consider a call for adoption on the DPOP draft. But um, that didn't go down that way. And maybe it's for the better, but there were uh, a lot of different comments, um, ex opinions, and concerns expressed around the draft. Um, and uh, I tried to capture the spirit of the meeting here around the outside here with all the various commenters. This was all taken from the YouTube uh, recording of, uh, of the meeting, actually just one meeting. But we didn't, we didn't get to a call to adoption. It's still an individual draft. And I think there's some, uh, some I guess, uh, diverse opinions about whether that should become a working group item or uh, as is, or whether there's other pursuits the working group should follow um, to try to attain some sort of some sort of um, reliable DPOP type, or um, I'm sorry, proof of possession type method in OAuth itself. Um, yeah, just setting a little bit of tone here. So Hanna suggested the interim, and we did get an interim scheduled, but it ended up being uh, focused around the, the 2.1 or whatever it may be called effort. Um, and then a, a later poll around discussing POP or DPOP, and then finally this sort of last minute uh, scheduling of this as we approach the 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 actual meeting here in Vancouver, um, assuming that does happen, but that's a, a different question. And uh, this list of drafts here, as well as um, Daniel, sort of asking what what happened to Depop in in the list of topics. Um, not necessarily because it's the only thing here, but it was it is sort of the catalyst of discussion right now around. Uh, how, how the working group proceeds with the, the pop question. So some of the motivations, um, at, at least in my mind, but I think in general, representing some of the working group motivations for something like DPOP or a generalized pop approach is really there's there's sort of this broad one that we, we'd like to do something that's better than bearer tokens. And that's broad. There's a lot of different reasons for wanting that, but I do think that um, there is at least some consensus for having something in this solution space. Also, we have the OAuth 2 security BCP that is, um, it was making its way through what last call, we might have another one, but it, it somewhat aspirationally, but it does recommend the use of sender constrained tokens. Um, and there's some work occurring in uh, the FAPI financial grade API working group that, that does the same, basically recommends or even requires the use of some kind of sender constraint or key constraint tokens. And largely, at least in the BCP, this is around preventing the play or replay 
um, at a different endpoint or resource from the one that originally received the tokens, but there's there's a number of other benefits that you know are bestowed upon POP tokens as well. Proof of possession bound refresh tokens for public clients, clients that don't themselves have um, provision authentication credentials is also a recommendation uh, of the security BCP. And there's really not a lot uh, we have available to actually realize that recommendation. And sort of furthermore, we're in this position where we have these recommendations, but OAuth really lacks a suitable and widely applicable POP mechanism. Um, the MTLS spec was recently published as a as an RFC, which is great, and I think it's super useful for a small sort of niche set of deployments. But uh, quoting um, some sentiment that I think is is held reasonably widely that it, it is virtually undeployable for general purpose applications. Um, I'll let them rename nameless, but a, a, w, a working group participant said that during the meeting and. Short of MTLS, we don't really have a, a viable solution that's specked out and interoperable that we can recommend um, to the, the populace at large at the same time that we have these um, best practice security documents that are saying you need to do this, which is sort of a problematic situation to be in. It, it's sort of um, you know, sending out advice that can't actually be met in, in, the, in the vast majority of cases. And the problems or, or, or the lack of solutions for POP type tokens is actually exacerbated when we're talking about single page applications or JavaScript applications running in the browser. If you look at MTLS for OAuth, it would have major, major usability issues with SPAs when you get into the browser requesting from the end user to select certificates um, outside of very, very tightly constrained sort of corporate environments that pre-provision certificates to their browsers. I, I don't think that this is the sort of thing that the average user um, is, is really capable or willing to deal with. It'll cause a lot more problems than it would any solutions. Um, and while many of us, myself included, um, sort of penned our hopes on token binding for a while, it's really dead in the water in terms of adoption and implementation in the world. And even if it was moving along, um, or it wasn't caught in the situation, it needed fetch level API changes to actually work for SPA type applications. And that's an even bigger sort of push to get in there. So it, it's just not happening. Um, there's a lot here. I'll try to go through these quickly, but reiterate some of the things that Rafat had at the beginning, which is sort of a, a look at the existing pop efforts that we've had in OAuth throughout the, uh, the ages, if you will. You know, OAuth 1 started with what was effectively a, a sort of Mac style uh, signature operation with the, the client key uh, or client secret or whatever it was called at the time, sort of mixed into all that. Um, and at least the folklore, the canon is that that was very difficult and that um, made interop very, very problematic. And as sort of a response to that, OAuth 2 itself pushed away from doing that level of sort of signature verification and tried to rely more, more completely on TLS. But the, some of the participants at the time, including the, the author up until the very end, was still interested in having some sort of pop work. So RFC 6749 does have open-ended extension points that would allow for this stuff to happen, even though the, the sort of the baseline framework and the initial stuff was released only with bearer tokens. Um, the author at that time was working on this Mac style tokens um, that was, uh, I don't know, somewhat active for a while, but but largely just died out due to lack of interest when he resigned from, from working on it and anything to do with the working group. Our working group here did get proof of possession key semantics for JSON web tokens published, RFC 7800, which sounds really fancy, but, and is super useful, but it doesn't do a lot in and of itself. It largely just defines the CNF claim, the confirmation claim, which is a way to embed in JOTS the key that you would probably need to confirm somehow to have a proof of possession token, but it's completely silent on the way that you would get that claim into the token in a reliable way or what means of actually proving possession what, or confirmation during an actual HTTP exchange or protocol exchange would look like. 
So it's an important building block, but it sort of doesn't do anything on its own. We had uh, an architecture document discussing sort of ideas and almost requirements around what proof of possession would look like, as well as uh, this authorization server to client key distribution draft, the pop key distribution, which describes, um, and it's now expired, but describes both how a public key could be presented to the authorization server by the client, or the server could present to the client a symmetric key, or it looks like list of symmetric keys, it's a little bit unclear, but really just about the, the client and the authorization server um, telling each other what keys to use for the tokens. And along with that, a sort of companion document at the time was this method for signing HTTP requests for OAuth, which was sort of a JOT-based um, pick your own parts, semi-canonicalized um, signing of the HTTP request with the key that presumably was um, received from the uh, use of pop key distribution. That also is, is fairly long expired and um, had a, a, a had the purported benefit of sort of being an a la carte selection of what was signed, which was meant to alleviate the potential problems with signing HTTP in general, which is that intermediaries often change or modify or add to requests as they go through. So the idea being that if you if the client said just what parts it was going to sign, um, you could work around some of those things, but also didn't have a minimum amount of what needed to be signed and, and left a lot up to sort of uh, be negotiated and figured out between the two. Um, and also wasn't able to handle some things like um, repeating request parameters and, and some other other cases like that. Um, I think we all know that sign HTTP requests are uh, uh, difficult difficult to do for a variety of reasons. Um, those, those two were sort of where proof of possession was going for a while. And then along came the, the shining promise of, of token binding, which did become a series of RFCs out of the token binding working group and were published um, as RFCs. But, and we also had here a, a OAuth profile of using HTTPS token binding. Um, and I admit to have been uh, very excited and distracted by this, but larger factors uh, came along and this, this work, as I described a little bit earlier, is, is basically um, dead. Um, although the RFCs are there, it's really not progressing. There's not adoption or implementation of the underlying technologies. And then the, the work in this working group on this particular draft stalled out around the same time. And it, it too is expired and not really progressing anywhere. Um, during the course of some of this stuff, uh, Nat published this uh, JWT pop token usage, which I, I wouldn't say is really uh, a protocol at all um, or anything that would be interoperable, but it is an interesting exploration of a few different ways that um, pop tokens could sort of manifest themselves, everything from um, some work that later ended up being part of the MTLS work right below it to uh, a challenge response type of protocol. And there's some ideas in there, but it, it nothing that took hold beyond um, at least laying the groundwork for some of the ideas that came up in the uh, OAuth 2 mutual TLS client authentication and certificate bound access tokens. So that one itself does a few things, including uh, client authentication and, and thus binding refresh tokens to that client authentication with mutual TLS, as well as affording the ability to bind um, refresh tokens to MTLS client authentication for public clients, and of course, generalized sort of proof of possession certificate bound access tokens. Um, it's now RFC, it's been implemented and deployed, it's out there, but it really does have some difficulties in deployment um, that are just sort of inherent in the nature of how mutual TLS deployments and trust frameworks and various components work. And so it can be used, it does meet a pretty high bar of security and binds these access tokens to private keys and proof of possession at the transport layer. It all works really well if you can get it deployed, but it's just not feasible, I think, for a pretty significant chunk of the deployments out there. Um, 
And in particular, the, the spa type deployments, it just, it's just, it's sort of a non-starter. It just doesn't work. And so uh, about a year or so, I've lost track of time. Um, some of us were talking at the OAuth security workshop and started to um, revitalize the idea of some sort of uh, application layer mechanism to do proof of possession that might be uh, a little bit simpler and more generally applicable than something like MTLS. And that eventually manifested itself in the form of the, the DPOP work, um, which we've discussed a few times at the face-to-face -face meetings and have either just not, not progressed yet um, and, and haven't gotten past the sort of individual draft stage. During, um, during the time leading up to the last meeting, there was a, a suggestion on list that uh, from Neil Madden, where he suggested what he called a tentative suggestion for an alternative uh, design, either to DPOP, a uh, change to DPOP, or maybe a, a distinct uh, document from DPOP, but that would be based on similar ideas about sort of sending a header, but rather than doing um, a full asymmetric signature on every single request, which there's been some concern expressed about the efficiency and cost of that, uh, he proposed the idea of looking into doing um, ECDH type key exchange up front in the series of exchanges and then um, you know using that using the resulting um, symmetric key to do uh, an HMAC rather than a, than a um, public key signature over the the sort of little proof token for each individual request which on um, when I first heard it it was it was leading up to the the meeting itself and I was sort of invested in presenting uh, Depop and sort of liked the idea, so I was I was a little reluctant to to really listen to it. But um, he did some additional work showing that it it is more complicated than Depop, but it's not as significantly more complicated. Probably it, it's maybe a, a, a step more complicated, not an organ of magnitude. So, and it maybe is a, a something that can land us in a in a middle ground of doing an application level proof of possession. That is also reasonably performant in terms of um, the the use of cryptography. So um, I, I include that here, even though it was just an email, because I I'm actually really interested in in the concept moving forward. I'd like us to think about it. So so Brian, and just question about that DPOP and the alternative approach also, and how is does does any of this overlap from with that any of the previous um, proposal that you listed at the top there? Um, not really. So, you know, everything, most of what we've done does overlap with RFC 7800, or maybe overlap isn't the right word, but does use RFC 7800 in some capacity to carry the, the sort of confirmation or proof key. But the actual, um, OAuth level and um, protected resource access request and response protocol stuff is not there. There's not the same kind of overlap, if that makes sense. Well, uh, uh, Brian, the, there is overlap. If like conceptually, like many of the solutions are very different, diff um, very similar. But for example, if you take the uh, Justin's HTTP signing, it's not that you do something entirely different. It's still HTTP signing you. You missed out one thing that I uh, relayed from the East working group when they worked on on OSCOR. Uh, they also thought that that would be a, a potential solution. But um, so I, yeah, I, you're I, right. There's, there's the solution there's space a, is finite here. There's That's a ton of con, there's a ton of conceptual similarity across a lot of these things. And um, you did put the OS core security in there, but I don't. I, I'm not sure that that's really the kind of solution um, in anybody in the OAuth space is is even interested in or looking at. But maybe others. That's could okay. Speak up. That, that's fine. Um, um, and and I mean, ultimately, yeah, it, it's all 
This is a difficult issue because at some level it's it's um it's really deceivingly simple. You have some key, you you encode some indicator of that key into the token, and then when you use the token, you prove possession of that key. And and at that level, they're all kind of like that, and they're all pretty similar. Um, but there's a lot there's there's issues that that have come up, and we've run into a lot of different problems. And I I think this long list of things is at least somewhat indicative of, of it not actually being that simple. So I guess trying to-, to... For example, if you, if you try to sort of like uh, illustrate the differences. So for example, in the, in the uh, pop key distribution that focused on symmetric and asymmetric keys, while you later remove the symmetric key part in Depop, uh, the token binding of course happened at a different layer, uh, which made it different, uh, of course, um, and the same is true for the mutual DLS, uh, also operates at the at the different layer. I, I believe that's, yeah. that's a, a, uh, big, a big, big difference. Right, what strikes me as interesting is actually the differences. So thanks for that, that list, uh, that was actually really helpful. I mean, it seems to me that we've done a lot of different things in the space, largely in response to needs. And so when we made something, it was responsive to it, and we've done it a number of times to be responsive, and we've, which is which is helpful. And then equally helpful is that we've gotten a lot of ex implementation experience of whether the solution that we thought would address the gap actually works. And it seems like we found various limits to those solutions. And kind of correct me here, it's, it feels like we're circling back and saying, hey, listen, should we be maybe thinking about all that implementation experience and is there a holistic solution that we could start be start thinking through, you know, something more generic? And so if that's accurate, what strikes me is, do we have a really good handle on all of those limits that I would translate instead of saying limits, saying all those requirements of the new thing we would want to generate? And if we were to have that, you know, and we were to say we have this draft depop, what's interesting to me is what would not be done? What's, what would not be solved with that? The one, one thing that uh, was an an issue that sort of like the Bob architecture was meant to collect use cases, requirements, threats, and so on. And one of the things, um, the symmetric key part was introduced there and also later uh, picked up by the ACE working group. And we had a discussion at some point in time on like, where would we do the parameter encoding for the HTTP transport? And where would we do the co-op stuff um, for this? And the decision back then was, after some back and forth with uh, the two groups was we do the HTTP stuff in, in OAuth and the co-op stuff in ACE. Um, and now Depop dropping the symmetric key, we suddenly left some, some strings hanging essentially for at least the ACE working group. I don't know if they changed their mind in the meanwhile, but uh, at least that was not my reading of um, some of the documents recently. Well, I mean, just a little bit on that, the ACE working group was, till a while ago, was tracking a normative dependency on key distribution, but have since removed it and defined all the parameters they needed or wanted for, for their framework document uh, in, in there. No, no, with the, um, the normative requirement, or the, the normative dependency still exists. Uh, the, the issue the... was we had a discussion and I can look up the email where we found the agreement. You may remember we had this debate in the OWAS working group where like who is going to do the work and then, then that was the uh, consensus and they, the encoding was actually removed from the document in OAS. Okay, well, I so I've reviewed the ACE document because I had to do it for um, a JWG claims request, and I I am personally not convinced that the encoding issue is solved. There's there's not a clean translation between the keys. Um, I think Jim raised this um, yeah, after looking at it more closely. Uh, I'm not sure what the resolution is, but ultimately the the ACE document does not normatively depend on pop key distribution anymore. Is and, my understanding as well is we are not normatively dependent upon any OAuth documents for that. So, so right or wrong, it's it's not that that's not there. So and how, the, how are then the use cases covered where you 
use HTTP to request uh, a token and then use, for example, co-op over NQBT uh, to pass it to the um, resource. Oh. I presume that's in the document, if that's one of the use cases that the ACE working group was trying to solve. I believe they have parameters defined to pass the key. And presumably there's a, a relevant encoding from either a, a JSON or a Seaboard implementation of the key or encoding that key. And I'm I'm not sure that actually works 100% of the time, but that's that's where it is. Jim, is that correct? The only big issue that I have run across is there are some I did I do not, did not care for the way that the, the CWT proof of possession token document did its registry work uh, because it is confusing in terms of whether the CWT and the JWT are supposed to be the same thing and how the different key identifiers are encoded. But there is, but that's pretty easy to work around. Um, and once we get some implementation experience, I think we'll just do an update to fix that. I just reviewed um, the MQTT document in ACE and I noticed that that's, the functionality wasn't there. And I posted it a mail to the list, and they also said they thought that it's done in OWASP. Which functionality do you believe is not there? Uh, using HTTP to request the token that is then passed along with MQTT to the um, to the resource, which is their model. Yes, I have that implemented on my machine. Well, but the question is, where is it in the spec? Um, at, at your request, the framework document is written to say you can use JSON and HTTP instead of co-op and Seaboard. Right. How, how do you get the keys for the POP token from the uh, authorization okay. server? That's what the doing, MQTT I, spec does. I, I am posting over HTTP to my, to my authorization server a ACE plus JSON message over HTTP. Um, I can push the code up. It's, it's, it, I haven't done that because it's not. I'm not happy with it yet. Um, okay. See, because I'm not using a real HTTP server. The well. Um... Maybe you want to respond to the email because the authors didn't know how to. Chidam um, Changul here. <clears throat> I'm one of the co-authors of the MQTT TLS profile. Um, I implemented it similarly to <clears throat> Jim said, but I knew that <clears throat> Highness raised an issue before. It was acknowledged in the group, and that's what I acknowledged in the email, saying that I'm aware of the issue. Um, I just. Um, <clears throat> The solution I was looking for was the text to say how to resolve the issue in the profile rather than an implementation issue. I think you, you've um, assumed that pop key distribution work would proceed. It was one of the I was looking at which described uh, how it's done for I uh, for for uh, the. Um, uh, for the HTTP case, um, but then Jim pointed out that this has been resolved in the main document in his last email, um, and that's where I left things. I guess we'll have to do some homework there again. Yeah, I, I can't help feel like this is a little bit back to what I was saying initially. You know, we're trying to create a generic kind of solution here, which is great to help lots of different, well, we can call them use cases, lots of different requirements. But do we get a, do we have a handle on it that if we had a candidate solution, Depop kind of or otherwise, 
that that would scratch the itch of all the places we need. And if it did not, what's left to do? Because what I would like to avoid if we're proceeding down a path of coming up with a generic solution that we make what we perceive to be a generic solution, we're done. And as soon as we're done, we say, eh, we actually didn't catch the following. If we can avoid it, that would be helpful. It would be helpful, but I don't I don't think we're we're necessarily looking for a generic solution um, so much as a deployable workable solution for OAuth deployments in the relatively near term. Like that there are dependent not dependent, but there are additional profiles and regulatory regimes and things that are demanding this stuff or placing requirements on this. And it would be really useful to have something that could be implemented and be interoperable and work. Brian, um, in the original OAS document, uh, one or two, we had the Mac solution. And then the Mac solution was, um, perceived to be difficult to implement. And that's why we then didn't go for that in OS2. Justin was then working on a, a more generic version of, of the Mac, trying to address some of the challenges with the signing. Yes, in, I'm, I'm aware I just talked about that. Right. Yeah. As well but as then, the previous Mac then, solution. And but then, I'm get, getting to that. Uh, but then the you came up with um, an alternative and Cabbage did so too. And um, Annabelle did uh, as well. I, I did not come up with an alternative to HTTP signing. I'm very, very much trying to do something that's not HTTP signing here. And I, I realize it's hard to distinguish between the two, but but there is a distinguishing factor there. Um, could I recommend that we let Brian actually finish a presentation for once? Because I, th I, I see where, I think I see where he's going with this, and I think it would benefit the rest of the group to see that as well. Uh, yeah, uh, thank you. Yeah, at least we would have that to, to discuss. Right, because these, these are different things. I don't believe that Depop is being presented as a generic solution. I don't think that it is necessarily stepping on the web signature, uh, the HTTP signature stuff that I'm working on with Annabelle and others, um, nor is it really an answer to the Mac draft um, in quite the same way. So I. I propose we let Brian actually talk. Thanks, Justin. Um, and I guess before I do, I will try to address what Roman was saying is in, in that I think the way you have framed things, Roman, is sensible and almost accurate. But in reality, there are um, a lot, a lot of disparate ideas and opinions and desires and use cases behind what, what is seemingly a, a simple case here. So it, it may not be as straightforward as, as you laid it out, as, um, as appealing as that might be. Um, so uh, circling back, trying to get through this, Depop was an idea. Um, it, it, it's still a, an individual drop, but it's an idea it does depart from some things because the way that the keys are distributed or shared is is fundamentally pretty different than what was what was described in in key distribution and sort of critically to that is part of the the sharing of the keys includes some level of proof of ownership of the associated private key and that itself um, enables things like the binding of a refresh token for public clients, which would not otherwise be possible and are not possible in, in the context of some, doing something along the lines of, of top key distribution. Um, it, it suffers from the potential problem, and we'll talk about this more, of, of being very inefficient due to the high use and the number of asymmetric cryptographic operations that are required. And Neil's suggestion on list was um, a way to do a lot of the same things, sort of get the more or less functional similarities in terms of how tokens are bound and used, but but do it in a way that's not as inefficient. Um, although that's just an email at this point. We've had some other things come up that I didn't even know until I started looking at this and following the train of drafts, but we have um, what looks to be um, from Annabelle 
a, a rewriting of the work that Justin did, but split into two drafts, um, which I, I just saw, I felt they should be here, but I'm not sure I understand the intent behind that. Uh, um, I do understand the intent, the intent, uh, and I can talk about that later if we have time. Okay. And then um, uh, relevant, but I, I do think sort of, um, not directly related is the generalized work on HTTP message signing, which Justin and Annabelle have taken, uh, correct me if I'm wrong here, but I think I got it right, have more or less taken Cabbage and uh, spruced it up a little bit and submitted it to the HTTP working group as a prospective sort of working group document going forward as a more general HTTP message level signature scheme and I believe that was, it hasn't been done yet, but it was, is adopted by the working group uh, to, as a work item going forward. Uh, yes. I'm not sure whether it was. I'm sorry, what? Uh, yeah, I was going to say, uh, yeah, I was going to say, I'm not sure whether it got adopted by the working group, but the sequencing yes. of, of getting it done in HTTP is definitely was in flight when I last saw uh, it. I thought I'd see the it, adoption. Yeah, it, it has, sorry to. This is Justin. Um, to sorry to jump in, but yes, it has been adopted by the working group, and um, and it is going to be a, an HTTP working group item, and um, and that is uh, to be clear where this sits with the rest of this work. That is just going to be um, on uh, on the scale of forming HTTP uh, forming signatures for HTTP messages and normalizing HTTP messages and whatnot. It does not, uh, it does not account for the security properties of token presentation or what a token means, or even if you're representing a token uh, with that presentation, or if you're just proving possession of a key as you make an HTTP request for some other reason. It is meant to be a very, very generic thing. Um, so that actually brings back to Annabelle's other proposed drafts where what she basically did was take the work that I had done previously, which was kind of a, um, a sort of a, a different swipe at what Cabbage had done uh, with, with the other draft uh, initially and bound, my work was bound tightly to OAuth. So what Annabelle basically did was say, Okay, assume that we have a general purpose HTTP message signature. What are the parts that we actually need from the OAuth signing draft um, going forward? Uh, to what do we need to be in the OAuth draft now that we could actually potentially depend on a general depend on and use a general purpose HTTP signing mechanism, which we could not previously. That's Annabelle's two other drafts. Whoa, okay, I did not read them that way, um, but that might be just a failing on my part. She also has some, uh, some what if drafts. So I'm, I, they're all named so similarly. I, I'm honestly not sure which drafts each of these are without going okay. and them up. But, but basically the, the two important ones are the one that's on the bottom and whichever one says, take that one that's on the bottom and put an OAuth token in it. Okay, I, those are the important parts. That latter one, I never found, or I read it wrong. But the, but but, but yeah, yeah, it's kind of yeah. There I there mean, there have been a handful of other what if okay ones, which those those may be, but they're they're less important. But yeah, you're right; they do exist. There's lots of ideas of how to do this out there. But again, sorry to uh, sorry to jump in you, trying to clarify. no no no. So you, it's helpful, Justin. You see how it is happens, right? Yeah, but I gave the floor back. Me too. All right, I'll take the floor. So while this was generally around POP in general, um, the, the, uh, the, the interim, the, the impetus for a lot of this came out of the presentation and early criticism or um, not early, heavy or, or vocal criticism of DPOP. So I wanted to revisit that, at least try to understand them a little bit better. Um, and so I tried to rephrase or paraphrase some of the, the criticisms of Depop that came out um, largely during the last meeting, but a little bit on the mail and, and comments here in the period. 
Um, and one of those is basically that it's not a uh, top key distribution. That that seems to be a running criticism. Um, and, and, and yes, it's it's not. It, it's a little bit different. Um, it it accomplishes some different things, and um, is is different. Um, Concerningly, I think, is that uh, an asymmetric cryptographic operation on every single HTTP request is just too expensive, um, at least for some. Um, it's been said to me both publicly and in private that, that this would be a non-starter for at least some organizations or deployments. It just couldn't be done, just too expensive. Um, and if, if you're not familiar with the, the details of DPOP, that's just an artifact of the way it works currently, the way it's written up. There, it requires a, a unique signature and signature verification over every signal request. And so that is potentially uh, expensive. Um, tracking JTI, so there's a replay prevention mechanism that, that suggests or requires that JTI be tracked um, and rejected if, if duplicates are seen. Um, and this makes some sense at a certain level, but it can be really prohibitive at scale. Um, if you have to coordinate sort of whatever data structures tracking JTIs across a large distributed deployment, um, that can be really problematic. And if you combine that with um, at least one way to address the, the prior issue is the asymmetric crypto is expensive, yes, but it could scale out horizontally very well, at least in terms of overall performance and latency. It might still be expensive to run, but it would scale out horizontally well. But if you introduce the need to sort of track JTI across all instances of whatever you're running, um, that sort of undermines the ability to scale horizontally, and that can be really problematic. Um, there is some language in there that I've loosened up to try to allow for sort of a, a a lazier or lighter weight approach of tracking JTI um, to the extent that it makes sense for the deployment, but it is, it's still, it, it's arguably problematic. Um, and I believe there was also the issue raised that, that it could also be sort of um, uh, unexpected or to the point of violating sort of general HTTP retry semantics on, in ID, I, I'm gonna say it wrong, idpotent um, requests if different layers of the architecture um, see a JTI and re, and prevent its replay when the, the actual processing of the message wasn't seen. So just generally JTI is problematic. Um, and this is kind of not actionable, but I do want to note that it, it's a bit of a Rorschach test, even among the supporters of Depop. I think different people have their different ideas of why it's useful and, and what the benefits bring for it. So even though there's a, a, a there, there's, criticisms as well as support of it, none of the support sort of rallies around the same thing. I don't think it seems like everybody wants to see a little something different out of it or, or has a different idea of how it'll benefit them, um, which, which makes, uh, I guess, a, a generalized voice of support and why this is good a little bit difficult. Um, I am personally a bit uh, like I've been on the fence about the asymmetric crypto cost. I mean, I recognize it's it's a fact of reality with asymmetric crypto, and it's definitely more expensive. But I feel like I don't know if it's legitimately a non-starter for real deployments or not. Um, it's real, but I don't know how real. I guess is a way of phrasing that. So, trying to sort of. Um, get a look at where we are now and, and where we might want to go. This isn't necessarily all the options, but this is the best way I could kind of phrase it together. Um, one thing we could do is we could stay the course of where we are now. Um, and I'm not exactly sure what that looks like, but it, it sort of stands to be something between doing nothing, which is largely what we were doing for a while, and maybe revving pop key distribution with some kind of HTTP signing mechanism. Um, and the, the work that's happening in HTTP seems a lot more uh, promising than having the OAuth level definitions of the same kind of stuff. But I don't know, that that's maybe, but it's also early, so see where that goes, I suppose, um, or, or not. I don't know, that the stay the course and sort of do what we've been doing um, hasn't, gotten us very far, but uh, there are some developments that might 
provide some of the underlying tools there that would make that more tenable going forward at some point, although I don't think that's a very near point yet. Um, I know there are some people, um, myself sort of on the fence, but some others too, that are at least somewhat interested in seeing uh, the Depop work adopted, possibly tweaked, uh, particularly around some of the JTI stuff, make it a little bit better um, and see if we can get that out there it, as a solution for people that are wanting to do something about this today. A uh, couple of quotes here I had from an email, I think off list, but you know, the, the performance characteristics of like Depop are, are not ideal in some circ circumstances, but, you know, for some of us mere mortals, it was said that Depop really is fine as is. It, it's functional and it can work. And that we have this need uh, to have some kind of sender or key constrained refresh tokens issued to SPAS yesterday. Um, at least for some, there's some real urgency here. They want to have a solution for this, and we don't have one right now at all. Um, binding refresh tokens, just the, there's... There's nothing available at this point um, in any sort of standards track to make this happen. So I think arguably there's some value still despite, despite the inefficiency problems, um, efficiency problems, excuse me, in Depop um, that we might want to consider taking on the work and moving it forward. But it, it also runs the risk of sort of complicating things by having multiple options. And we already have a lot of documents, a lot of options. And, I think we do need to be conscientious of, of the way we message and the number of solutions we produce in this space. As I alluded to earlier, Neil Onless suggested an approach um, that's somewhat similar to Depop in at least some of the conceptual levels, but, in, but using asymmetric keys, binding tokens to asymmetric keys, but using ECDH uh, to sort of prove possession of those keys and then to amortize the cost of asymmetric crypto over many requests. Again, this would be riffing on Neil's idea. Um, and this would allow for, even allow for the derived or agreed upon key to be non-exportable. So it could be kept inside of either virtual or real sort of um, TPM-like things or within sort of the non-exportable world of the browser um, web crypto API and allow for unique keys to be negotiated between client and RS or client and AS that are used uh, you know, with an HMAC to show sort of bind to some amount of the HTTP request to prevent at least large scale or easy replay, show possession of that key, but do so in a way that they're only re unique to those two parties and we don't get back into the need to have additional sort of um, um, audiencing of tokens and so forth to prevent cross RS replay. Um, it's, th there's work <laughs> that would need to be done here, um, but I, after thinking about it quite a bit, um, I'm starting to feel like there's a lot of merit in this idea. And then, uh, I don't know, do something and profit, which is just a, a nod to the old uh, underwear gnomes uh, piece from South Park, a little picture up there on the right. So just quick question uh, Brian just for me to understand uh, the, the first uh, the first bullet there you saying that if we go with the first bullet there the proposal then that will address your needs and you don't need the second bullet the depop uh, oh no it doesn't address my needs at all so these are these are two different things that you probably need anyway way right is that is that what you're saying um I guess that's part of the problem. I don't know. I would like to see, I, I don't think the first one, it, it doesn't solve all the needs and the, the immediacy of it, I don't think is where people want to see it. I, I personally see bullet number one as throwing in the, the towel and just waiting to see what happens with HTTP signing. It doesn't solve anything immediately. I, I tend to agree. I just, I felt I, I don't know. I felt somewhat compelled to at least sort of note that that is an option here. We don't have to do anything, but, but I agree with you. It does sort of feel like throwing in the towel and just, just giving up. Um, and even if, and when an H2B signing finds itself sort of fully realized and deployable, um, and I, uh, I say that with a, a nod and hope 
towards Justin and Annabelle for good work there. And I, but recognizing that it's really, it's hard. It's really hard. Um, but even if, if we get that done, then there would still need to be a layer of sort of profiling that over OAuth. And in the current world, that still doesn't give us anything for refresh tokens. So, it... so, so let me just again make sure I understand. So, so you're saying even if we HTTP signing, but we'll go uh, and get approved tomorrow, uh, we still have kind of gaps in that solution that will not address the DPOP needs. Is is that what you're saying? Effectively, yes. If we get the HTTP signing, is that still putting us in the same level of we need a signature operation on every message? I believe those things are largely orthogonal because the HTTP signing is, well, I, it, I guess it depends on what comes out of it, but it's really a lot more about HTTP canonicalization than the actual signing itself. And I presume either way, it's going to allow for an asymmetric or a HMAC over, over whatever that canonicalized or hashed um, representation of the HTTP message is. The, the sort of asymmetric symmetric is really, uh, it, it's, it's an orthogonal issue, I think, um, in how the keys are agreed upon and used between the two. Um, and as I say that, there's there's likely some small intersection of signing over some bit of the HD message, regardless of which way you do it. But but having HTTP signing done even yesterday doesn't doesn't solve the asymmetric versus symmetric crypto issue. It it maybe gives some different tools for the syntax of what it looks like in presentation, but it doesn't address the core core fundamental piece of it. So if I can just make sure I understand what you mean by that. So for some, even if we do that option one, it may still be too expensive, If it, even if it happened today? Um, maybe it depends on how it would be. I, I, that ends up being more of a deployment and algorithm choice question, I guess based on my understanding of how these things work. Um, okay. but yeah. oh, sorry, go ahead. I, I was gonna mumble and say nothing worthwhile, so please. <laughs> okay, so to give, some, uh, <laughs> to give some perspective on the HTTP signing work, um, yes, we are starting with the Cabbage draft, but we are by no means stopping there. There are some very, very big problems with the Cabbage draft. It's very limited in um, in sort of uh, how it can manage keys in determining what is allowed to be signed and what is required to be signed and things like that. So to uh, to what I think may have been part of Jim's question, um, you know, do you have to recalculate the signature over every request? Well, that kind of depends on what it is that you're signing as part of that request, and um, if you have a uh, a profile that says you must sign, you know, a nonce on every request and check that for replay, then yeah, that's going to change. If you are um, signing parts of the request that don't change over time, including perhaps uh, the access token value itself, then, then yeah, that signature wouldn't change over time. The HTTP signing thing isn't really it's not really going to be its job, at least this is my view as one of the editors, it's not really going to be that specs job to dictate um, that type of uh, requirement. Uh, that's more on the security layer um, of the application of the signing spec. What the signing spec is, is going to do is say, you have an HTTP message, here's how you throw that into a um, into a signature or hashing function. And here's how you take the result of that and shove it back into an HTTP message so that you can send it. Um, that's really all that it's 
uh, yeah. ultimately that's what it's going to do. So Brian is absolutely right that even if we had a workable, uh, fully functional HTTP signing thing today, which Cabbage is not for our purposes, for some very specific reasons, uh, but even if we did have that today, we would still need an OAuth profile of it that said, yes, you actually have to sign the access token. Um, and, and by the way, this is how you send the access token so that it's tightly bound to the signature that you're sending. Um, so yeah, it's, there would still be work within this working group. I think there will be work within this working group, um, even in the light of the HTTP signing draft. And maybe just to clarify a little bit too, what, uh, you, everything you say there is accurate, Justin. The way I was thinking about the asymmetric versus symmetric was really with the expectation that however this is done, almost certainly a HTTP request is going to need a new signature over it. Um, and that even if that wasn't the case, the, the complexity of trying to determine when a signature could be reused um, in a in some case that that might be allowed is probably prohibitive enough to make it unlikely. So I was really down to believing that it's probably going to need to be done each time. And so the distinction in my mind around performance is really just using an asymmetric signature versus an HMAC, where asymmetric is, you know, it's a couple of milliseconds, but to some that's prohibitively expensive, where calculating or um, uh, verifying an HMAC is basically no op in, in our world these days and, and I think is can be considered performant enough that doing it every time is is doesn't matter at all. Okay. That's uh I understand your interpretation now. Thank you. Thank you for clarifying that. But but but, but what you said is also true. Uh, we're just thinking about it in different ways. Right, exactly. Because if you look at uh if you look at the depop proofing mechanism, uh it only signs the method, the URI without parameters. Um and the uh, the token itself, right? Uh, no, it, it, it does it, not sign the token. It does not sign the token. The, to right. the token is bound to the associated key. Right, right. So it's key presentation and token in here. Yeah, but there's also a, um, a JTI in there that, and so at least the way the way it's written now means a new a new one every single time. And that's that would be sort of expensive. I think doing the same kind of thing with an HMAC would be okay. It's it's so fast that it I don't think it would be prohibitive to anybody. Right. But because of the key distribution mechanism in Depop, that's that's a bad idea. Yeah. Well it doesn't yeah, like it doesn't really it doesn't work. It doesn't work. Exactly. Right, exactly. Um, so yeah, for the uh for the HTTP signature thing, uh we are fully intending that to be both symmetric and asymmetric algorithms because there are people that have been deploying uh, cabbage and cabbage derivatives out there, of which there are at least a half dozen that I know about personally, um, which means there are a lot more. Um, it, it, people are using it in both of, in both of those modes. Um, so my view of this, of the depop work and the HTTP signing work is that they they seem to solve they do seem to solve similar problems, but depop um, really isn't as general purpose as it might seem at first, and I think that that's a feature. Um, it it was not my impression on first reading the draft, and I've told the authors this that it was it's designed as you know key presentation for single page apps. But if that's what it is, it does that really well. Um, and it can probably be used with other apps too, um, if they want to, but ultimately we're, I think we are going to have a general purpose proof of possession with a general purpose HTTP message signature um, that, I don't see a reason why that can't live in parallel to to Depop. Um, there's already more than one way to solve these problems, and it makes sense in different ways for different use cases. And different deployments is really the biggest thing. Uh, I agree with you there, but and I don't know what the number is, but at some point there are too many options. 
I, 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 get I don't that. know what that number is. Yeah, I, I get that argument, but I, I think that that ship has sailed and come and set <laughs> off again uh, in, yeah. terms of, in terms of OAuth. It's my question from my side, Torsten. What we have today? Sorry, you broke up. Try again. My question is to inform the, the decision or the, the discussion. How many deployable options do we have today? Because Justin and Brian were talking about options, too many options. Deployable, we have one, and it's not deployable in a significant number of cases. Okay. So even if we would uh, push uh, Depop forward uh, and also have a solution based on the upcoming HTTP signing, it would be three options in total. That's true. Um, well, but I, I guess I'm maybe because I've been thinking about it. I'm also considering the third bullet here as well. Um, so potentially yeah, but that. So in terms of actual implementations uh, for for key proof of possession, we have implementations of MTLS. We have implementations of Depop, and we have implementations of my old HTTP yeah. message signing that are still kicking around. Fair. So those are the three that I'm aware of. There are people that are doing cabbage, but uh, that are kind of tied to OAuth, but not in any interoperable way. Um, um, so, so, so question, so. Um, can we take the, um, and split up the symmetric versus asymmetric and the actual initial distribution of the key from the proof over the actual request of resources. So right. that's what that's that's the plan for the general uh that was the plan for the general purpose OAuth pop. That's that's how it was structured. And that I think is the right method for the general purpose HTTP signing mechanism. Because how you get the key and how you use the key should be two different questions. Mm -hmm. um, because I mean, if you look at, for example, how uh, AWS does their key derivation uh, for for their signing stuff, like it's not it's not a dynamic key distribution system. You do you do a derivation algorithm, and then you use the key that you have, like you know, four steps into the process to actually call the API. The signing mechanism that you use for that should be the same, whether or not you did this fancy uh, Amazonian. Uh, key derivation, or if somebody just said, hey, here's a jock, use it. I'm just wondering if uh, a HTTP working group supplied message signature system and EPOP could eventually be reduced to you know, uh, what sort of message are you signing on those requests? So I think, so this is, this is just my opinion as justin um i think that if we had general purpose http signing then depop could use that and still do its um you know it's optimized uh key distribution and proofing and presentation um but we just we don't have that and it's going to be a long time before we do so this is mike jones i wanted to add a few comments to some of the questions that have been raised. First, I wanted to respond to the what is deployable. Um, Microsoft is on record as having internally deployed the old OAuth HTTP signing for some internal proof of possessions for Office 365 and Azure. And the reason we did that is it's stable. Uh, it's stable by merit of being an abandoned draft and nobody's revising it, but it gives us something as a stopgap that we can deploy until there's consensus around something better. Um, that said, um, our product groups would also like something that's simple like Depop. I realize that Depop is still in flux um, but in particular, uh, you know, John and I and uh, 
Brian talked during the last IETF about, okay, how could we add symmetric to DPOP along the lines of what Neil had suggested? And there's a, a feasible path to do that. It is not quite as simple, but, uh, you know, inherently you're having to do a key distribution step beforehand. I do agree with Justin that while the general HTTP signing is of long-term value, uh, it would be great to get DPOP into a stable state soon so that an industry which is dying for this uh, could have it. This is not academic. People are stealing bearer tokens and using them to carry out attacks, and there's a number of mechanisms for that. And so I think we do have an onus to meet that market need sooner than later. So I would like to see the DPOP draft adopted as a working group draft, recognizing oh, that we may, may continue to revise it to add symmetric. Oh, so, so, so you're saying you, you support adopting a, a DPOP as is and later adding symmetric instead of initially or, or work on symmetric right now? Is that, is that what you're saying? I support adopting it as is to get it in the working group's attention. And then the working group can make a decision about whether to also add symmetric. We know how to do it. Okay. But I'd like to see the adoption happen so that we're signaling to the marketplace that we're addressing this issue rather than just waiting years. This is Philip Skokan out zero, and I share that sentiment. We'd also like to see adoption of the current state as is. Yeah, I guess we will call for adoption uh, on, on the mailing list anyway. But yeah, if if people feel that they want to say that they support it, yeah, go ahead. Feel free to do that. Yeah. Okay. So I wanted to ask a clarifying question about, so we've, we've been talking a lot about what I would characterize as option one and not option one. Can we be, finesse a little bit about what I would say is option two and three? How should we go about kind of reasoning about three, given what we have written in two? Wait, what are one, two, and three? I do not see those on the slide. Uh, the first I'm, sorry, I'm, purple I'm purple. logically just numbering them. And I so almost had the numbers here. I apologize. Yeah, I, I'm calling one stay the course, two push forward with the DPOP kind of as is, and then three was we've had some some kind of conversation from Neil's idea about doing something different, and you know, four I'm not talking about that really has kind of an option. So is there something we need to talk about two versus three? Because that's three seems like a bunch more work than beyond what we've written down in two. Unless I'm misunderstanding it. it. It's certainly more work to write down and there's nothing in draft form written down beyond some ideas. Um, it, it is something that could potentially be grafted on to two. And so they are kind of one in the same and you could somehow to choose at runtime, which to do, but I think that would be. Having thought about it a little bit, I think that would be prohibitively difficult um, and super complicated. And so I guess three would be um, likely be its own thing that could live alongside and be deployed independently of or even in conjunction with two if and when it, it got to that stage. Um, or we could or, or it could just not be pursued and we see if the, the need really arises or not. Um, or I guess the, some of my thinking was that the, the pushback on the performance of DPOP 2 is so significant that it's not worth pursuing and we should jump ahead to trying to build out 3 so it's more, it, it, accomplishes a lot of the same things, but is a little bit more, a lot more performant and a little bit more complicated. That's sort of where I was trying to drive this, I guess, was either, to be honest, I'm a little uncertain, so I'm not sure, but I'm, 
adopting DPOP is fine moving forward with it. it doesn't preclude anything if three, but I do think there's the risk of having too many options. I'm not sure that's the threshold or not. It may be just fine to do both. I'm, I'm sorry, is did the, I answer it at all, Roman? Is, is the assessment that three is that two is 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 too slow or cost too much based on just theoretical um assessment or is it a practical experience um i think it's yeah, I, know, I know that ashmec is 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 is, is faster than, than rsa and other asymmetric crypto algorithms the question is whether this is really a problem i, I believe on the last meeting there was some strong language about asymmetric simply not being feasible for AWS uh, compared to their current scheme. But as the slides say, for us mere myrtles, DPOP is fine as is, and I can confirm that with my deployments. I think, yeah. it, I think it depends on the use case, which is efficient enough. There's plenty of things where the volume is low enough that symmetric, asymmetric crypto is simple and fine. If you're running AWS, or maybe if you're running Azure, uh, every cycle counts, and you'll do the extra protocol steps to do that. But I think in terms of engaging the working group, uh, the, the normal way to engage the working group is to adopt a working group document and then revise it so that's what i'm proposing I fully, I fully agree with mike on that point i mean let's move that forward and if there is a need for having a more efficient scheme people will step up and will contribute um new algorithms protocol extensions and so on to to make that happen so for to me the, the whole conversation feels like a committee um uh wanting to decide what the best solution will be for the market uh Phil Hunt here. I, I just had a question, um, somewhat orthogonal to the current discussion, but it may play in given the timeline to do this work. How does TLS 1.3 make some requirements moot or, or alter uh, outcomes to, to this work? And I sort of say that in the light that Brian did a great job highlighting all the different efforts that have gone on, and I'm sort of concerned that we pile in again on Depop or some variation just to find out that it will have its own problems because of the other things that are changing around us, i.e. TLS 1.3, and if the HTTP working group is starting to do signing, is it premature? I, I'm just wondering about that. I don't think there's anything there. Um, Depop is moving away from the reliance on any kind of key or exported key or identifier from the transport layer. Mm -hmm. um, and so it could be deployed over 1.3, just the same as it would over 1.2. Um, and there's, it's kind of a, a no-op. There were, there were, yes, there, there were some potential problems with the exported key material in token binding because it wanted to play across those layers. But in this particular, like where we're trying to work on the application layer around DPOP is 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 sort of completely independent of that. So I don't I don't think there's an intersection or overlap there. Okay. And, and as far as the HTTP thing, uh, I will just reiterate that as one of the authors our editors of that spec as it moves into the HTTP working group, I do think that there's room for both. I do not think that Depop should be stretched and twisted to be a general solution. I, I don't think it is. I think it, and Brian, I mean this in the best way possible. Uh, I think that it is a really clever hack for a really specific set of uh, deployments and use cases. Um, I, I wouldn't and, have used the word hack, but I otherwise agree with you. Right. Yeah, I figured that's where the... Or the contention would be, but uh, what concerns me is the tendency by the market to try and always, always find to take one solution, whether it's appropriate or not, and apply it everywhere. And then I get upset. Why we need more than one solution, Phil? This is exactly why we need to do multiple things instead of trying to pretend that we're going to come up with one thing and apply it everywhere. I, yeah, I, that's that's why I think we should do EPOP. It's pretty well defined. It's it's implemented. Uh, uh, 
a number of times. I think it could use a little bit of cleanup for, for the most part. I think it makes a lot of sense as it stands today. If there's a clever way to do to layer in symmetric stuff on there without exploding everything, I think that that makes some sense. Uh, but I honestly think that things like AWS shouldn't use it. I mean, you know, sending the entire key or something like that every time doesn't make sense at the scale of AWS anyway. Um, you know, there, there's a whole provisioning thing that is outside the model of Depop, which is about these, um, you know, uh, limited uh, limited deployment, um, you know, there's a copy of an app that has one key that you may or may not have seen before, and then you just need to protect the tokens for that. Um, you know, AWS should be using the HTTP in an ideal world, the eventual HTTP signing from the working group, which is of course based largely in part on AWS signatures uh, in, in its history, and layering in the OAuth access token binding that I hope this working group to uh, adopt at some point in the future when the time comes. Um, I mean, I don't see these as uh, as competing with each other so much as they are complementing different bits. Now, are there going to be a number of places that will deploy Depop and then when this other stuff comes around, they turn around and say, oh, that actually fits better? Yeah, probably. But I mean, same argument with the stuff we're doing at TX Auth as well. If it's, if, if is it that we need to make clear, and I, and I like the point that Brian made again, was that the, the issue of proof of possession is orthogonal to, to message signing. Um, and maybe that's the track is to say, number one, those two things are always going to be separate going forward. And that way they're clear and have a greater chance. And then within those forks, those two orthogonal approaches, to your point, Justin, there may be need for specialization because it is difficult to do general purpose. Um, I'm just a little worried that we're repeating a cycle again for the third or fourth time in 10 years. So. Um, I'm, you know, we have to keep working on it. I'm just not sure that we're working on the right thing yet. Um, so this is Mike Jones again. I, I will point out that the slides left off, maybe uh, mercifully, one piece of the pop history in the OAuth working group, which is we created something called OAuth1, which used proof of possession tokens. And the marketplace largely abandoned it because of the interoperability problems encountered when trying to actually do the HTTP signing in the way specified. When I was looking at MTLS and I was quite excited by it, I, one of the problems I ran into was a similar perception of do we really need it? Um, Mike, you spoke to that there are threats with bearer tokens, but I think there's sort of there's two extremes right now to sign everything and encrypt everything and throw crypto at every layer and do everything and go nuts. But none of those actually work. And then the other people are saying, but this stuff's working. Why are we why are we complicating things unnecessarily? And and so it's frustrating to me to say what's the right level. Now, I guess that's why I like the idea if we say, okay, if we solve token binding and that's all we solve that's a big improvement and then maybe it's appropriate that the apps which is a more of a niche area like financial apis look to their own solution in that niche because they can specialize it appropriately um, part of why re reflecting on my oauth one semi throwaway comment is part of why i like depop is <laughs> Just like bearer tokens, it does very little. It does just enough more to actually get proof of possession. And you know, as Justin described the glorious hack or whatever you want to characterize it as, it 
signs just as little as possible to be able to uh, demonstrate proof of possession for the tokens, thereby solving a marketplace need. Yeah, I, I like that. As, as Justin and some others have said too, the, there's definitely some opportunity available in the text of the draft to make some of those things more clear. And uh, I don't think it's as simple as saying this is for only spa type apps. I, I do think there's a lot that could benefit from clarifying sort of uh, what it is and isn't and what it can do. Um, I've certainly signed up to work on that text going forward if, if we proceed with this. Okay. Yeah, thank you. That's a very good discussion, guys. Uh, any anybody else has any any other comments that they want to chime in? Separate uh, the different from from what we heard so far. Okay. Okay. Uh, like I've I've heard lots lots of support for Depop, uh, but we're not going to be able to call kind of. Uh, um, a hum or something for for this, we will have to take it into into the mailing list uh, to give everyone an opportunity to chime in. So, uh, but I think it, it was was a really good discussion, and uh, I guess uh, that's where we uh, that's. I think next step is just to take it to to the list and 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 see if people are interested in adopting this and and whether it's a it's asymmetric and symmetric is is a different story we can the work group will have to decide later on uh, on the scope of that but uh, but i think uh, um the goal all, all the, the action right now for me at least uh, for uh, as as chairs to ask for adoption on the mailing list and and see how how that goes is that fair anybody has um Sense. Re Re uh, at the beginning of the meeting, Jim asked on uh, sort of how many folks on the call are going to be at the face to face meeting. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's a good, good question. So, yeah, I just wanted to finish the, the first one. Anybody has any comments about the next step for the Depop discussion? So Rifa, just to just to, so if I can confirm it. So what what what's going to happen is on the mailing list there'll be a call for adoption. It will not be framed as the different options the way we've been talking, which has been very informative. But we're going to be just very precise. We have a draft. Are we are we adopting or not adopting the draft? Right. Correct. Correct. That's that's exactly what. Perfect. The plan. Okay. Just checking. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, okay. Um, anybody any has any other comment about this? Before I ask uh, who is going to be in in Vancouver, okay. So so regarding Van Vancouver, unfortunately, neither I nor um, Hannes will be there, uh, and we wanted to uh, know who's who's planning on attending the meeting in Vancouver to understand if we can like have a meaningful meeting. So who's attending in person? I plan to. Um, I plan to. If I get happen. Yeah. Also planning to, Aaron here. This is Mike. I plan to. Uh, this is David. I also plan to. David. This is from Spencer. I'm planning to if others are going to be there. Tony, I'm planning to. Who was the last one? Sorry. Tony. Tony. Anybody else? That's all. This is Matt. I'll also be attending, but it's also it depends a lot on like if other people are attending, which seems a lot of people are having the same thought. Um, I wonder if there's a more formal way to to make sure that we everybody's going yeah. to actually confirm that. Bit of game theory, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, you know what? Maybe maybe we can put some. Yeah. Go ahead. For what it's worth, I plan to go unless. Unless the entire meeting is canceled, yeah, that, by the ITF. Yeah, same. That, that's yeah. That that that's still I think under consideration there. <laughs> I, <laughs> it might. I don't know. This is a challenge. Taking no formal taking no formal position. Uh, the IESG is actively considering uh, all three constraints as Jay has been putting on the IETF list. 
period, no further comment. Thank you. <laughs> okay, thanks. <laughs> okay. Uh, okay, that, that's all, I think. Uh, anybody else have any other comments or something that they want to discuss? Okay, great. Uh, well, thank you very much. Yeah, go ahead, Brian. You want to? I was just going to say thank you to you and yeah. uh, Hannes and, and the ADs for putting this together. Okay. No, oh, thank you guys and appreciate your help. And that was a great discussion. So thank you for that. And um, we'll take it to the list to continue this discussion. Okay. That's good. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Take care. Bye. Bye. Good evening, everyone. Bye. Thanks, everyone. Bye.